On the 9th of June 1979, a deadly fire broke out on the Ghost Train ride at Luna Park, Sydney. While it started out small, flames quickly spread and overcame the ride, burning it to the ground. Seven people died that night in the blaze, including six children ranging in ages from 13 to four years old. An investigation ensued and the fire was quickly ruled to be the result of an electrical fault. But today, 40 years later, there are still questions and speculations that swirl like smoke around the horrific ghost train fire. There are whispers of a cover-up involving very important and dangerous people. Was the fire in fact intentionally lit? And if so, who did it? Were the deaths that night just the result of a terrible accident? Or was it murder? Welcome to the Ghost Train Fire of 1979. Hi, thanks for joining us again. <laughs> Welcome back to my channel. I'm so glad you chose to voluntarily hang out with us again. <laughs> Great choice, if you ask me. 10 out of 10 would recommend. Two thumbs up. If you haven't seen this face before, then hi, hello, my name is Liz. And if you like true crime and unresolved mysteries, then you should just probably hit subscribe and we can be like, the bestest of friends of all time, if you want, and if you don't want, because we're best friends now. If you've seen my videos before, then you know that this is the part that I usually say, editing Liz, let's switch to Lily Cam. But as you can see, I'm on Lily Cam today. I've switched things around a little, but as you can see, Lily is still here. She's totally ready to give us emotional support and potentially introduce lots of visual and audio interruptions to this video because that's what she thinks her job description is. <laughs> and now that all the introductions are done, it is time to strap yourselves in for a wild one because we are going to start this case. Luna Park Sydney was opened on the 4th of October 1935 and it was pretty much immediately a very successful staple in Circular Quay Sydney which also housed the Sydney Harbour Bridge and later the Sydney Opera House. On the opening day there were just massive queues of people lining up under the gigantic iconic big face that overlooked the park and this face was based on illustrations of the character old king cole but i'm sorry having been there myself and seen it in person there's just no denying it's creepy i don't mean to question your decisions park designers but that face is creepy many people in the queue are hoping to be the very first ones on the big dipper the park's massive wooden roller coaster and after the grand opening the lines would continue thanks to luna park's instant ability to draw in and entertain sydney locals and tourists alike i mean this was before everyone had tvs and smartphones to entertain them so the park was really very successful the ghost train itself was one of the original rides in Installed for the grand opening in 1935 and along with the Big Dipper it was a huge hit. Most park patrons went on it at least once per visit and they were drawn in by the crackling soundtrack that played outside which promised them the most spine tingling ride of their lives. Originally the park would close during the winter months and this would be the time that was assigned to perform regular maintenance and repairs on the rides. But from 1969, the park stayed open year round, lessening that opportunity that had been there to perform that maintenance and keep the rides in really good nick. In the 50s and 60s, as TVs had made their way into everyone's homes and as drive-ins and motor cars in general had become more popular, there had been a slow but steady decline in the park's numbers. There was a stage in 1970 where it looked like Luna Park was going to be demolished and replaced with high-rise buildings, but the New South Wales government rejected this plan. Luna Park was on Crown land, which means it was owned and protected by the government, and they wanted to keep the land as it was, as an amusement park. 
like I said, Lunar Park was a staple in Circular Quay and they didn't want it to go to someone that was just going to knock it down and replace it with skyscrapers. So they found new management and they gave the park a revamp, including the big iconic face, which had started to droop, making it even more creepy if that was possible. New rides were added as well and the park claimed back some of that popularity from its golden days. It became a popular day out again so families and couples, teenagers and tourists would consistently fill the park again. And Saturday the 9th of June 1979 was no different. Crowds streamed in through the gates going on rides like the Dodgem cars, the river caves, the ghost train of course, um, playing games in the arcade alley for cheap prizes, eating too much fairy floss and candy, you know all of the fun fairground stuff. And among these fun seekers were five schoolboys between the ages of 12 and 13 from Waverley College, a Catholic boys school in the eastern suburbs of Sydney. This was the first night that these boys had been allowed out at night without parental supervision and make no mistake it was a tough gig talking their parents into letting them go especially their mothers because mothers but these boys had begged and pleaded and bargained even agreeing to the condition that they first attend mass at St Mary's Magdalene Church before going to the park so their parents caved and let them go. So onto the ferry that night got Jonathan Millings, Michael Johnson, Seamus Rahili, and Richard Carroll. These boys were all 13 years old and had been lifelong friends. Like they were rarely seen apart. The people that knew them, knew them as the four amigos. They could often be seen riding their bikes together around Vaucluse, the suburb they lived in in Sydney and exploring and playing on the beach and, you know, getting up to the harmless mischief that teenage boys did. They were joined that night by their friend Jason Holman. Jason also went to Waverley College, but he was 12 years old, so a whole year group below them. But the boys graciously let him tag along as they quite often did. He was like the fifth wheel to the four amigos. And he had managed to swindle permission from his parents to head out that night as well. Also, headed to the park that evening was the Godson family, which was made up by Jenny Godson, her husband John, and their two young boys, Damien, who was six, and Craig, who was four. The family was holidaying in Sydney from their small rural hometown of Warren, which was a six hour drive away. The Godsons had saved for months for this holiday. And for them, a holiday in Sydney was just a very extravagant occasion. They were so excited to take Damien and Craig to Taronga Zoo and of course, Luna Park. After spending a few hours at the zoo, the family had a little bit of a hitch in their day caused by train driver strikes which had meant that they had had to catch multiple buses instead and they arrived at Circular Quay a little bit later than they had intended. But as dusk approached and the family got onto that ferry with Damien and Craig wearing the matching jumpers that Jenny had handmade for them, the family watched the lights of the park loom closer and the stress and bother of the trip there was soon forgotten and replaced with giddy anticipation. Jenny, John and the boys went on every ride they could as a family together, including the Big Dipper, which was the boys' first roller coaster. And Jenny said the boys were just as white as ghosts after because they had been so scared, but they were just having the best time ever. And then before they knew it, it was starting to get late. The boys had had a big day and they were beyond tired. Jenny and John told them they could go on one last ride and the boys just screamed ghost train because they had enjoyed it so much the first time. Jenny decided she wanted an ice cream and she asked them if they wanted some as well, but the boys said no. They were too excited to get back on that ride. So she left John and the boys out front of the ghost train, assuming that they would wait the couple of minutes it would take for her to go get an ice cream and come back and they would all go on the ride together. Meanwhile, the Waverly boys were running for the Dodgem cars. They had also just had the best night ever, being on the Dodgem cars multiple times already, 
going on the ghost train, the Big Dipper, playing the arcade games. There had been a group of girls that night that were supposed to meet up with the boys at the park that had never showed, but the boys didn't let this dampen their spirits, nor the fact that just as they arrived at the Dodgem cars hoping to have one final go, the ride operator was just closing the latch on the gate. They instead just looked at each other and shouted, ghost train. It was just after 10 p.m. and while other rides at the park was slowly closing down one by one, the ghost train was still in full swing, so a lot of people chose this as their final ride for the night. The ghost train itself was a two and a half minute journey through the pitch black building that housed the ride. The only lighting came from neon paints that were illuminated by ultraviolet lights. It featured a 180 meter electric track that was full of twists and turns, and the ride itself was jam packed with just spiders and skeletons and monsters made from plaster and things like webs that would drift over your face as your train car went through made from hessian material and because of all those twists and turns while you were on the ride you were disoriented to the point where you didn't know what way was forward and what way was back and where you had been versus where you were going. About two thirds of the way through the ride, there was this open caged area that the train cars would pass through and everyone outside would be able to see you and you would be able to see out into the park. And then the next doors you went through, after your eyes adjusted to the darkness again, you would see an imitation fire on your right hand side made up of silk streamers and a fan underneath and red and yellow globes. And it was this fake fireplace where people later reported first seeing actual flames. But with it being a fake fire, a lot of them originally thought it was just very realistic. So unfortunately, they didn't think much of it and didn't report it to the ride staff. People also later reported smelling smoke at this stage. But again, they had just thought that this was part of the ride's special effects. It wasn't until the fire very quickly spread out of control and thick black smoke started filling the building that people on the ride started panicking and getting out of their train cars and trying to find their way out through the convoluted tunnels. But because of the nature of the ride, as I mentioned, it was pitch black. They didn't know which way was which and any door they found might have just led them further into the building. There was no emergency lighting and no sprinkler system, despite strong recommendations from the local council a year earlier when the ride had been inspected. It was quite literally a death trap. When a few people did eventually make it out of the building and were finally able to notify the staff, unfortunately the staff just didn't understand the nature of the emergency or that there was even an emergency occurring. There was usually an attendant that was assigned the role to walk around and patrol the inside of the ride. But the staff member that had been assigned that role that night had told his managers weeks in advance that he had a 21st birthday party to go to that night and they had failed to replace him. So there were no staff inside the ride that night to raise the alarm. On top of that, the fire was burning in the later stage of the ride. So the staff that were at the entrance punching tickets and letting people on the train cars wouldn't have been able to see anything amiss from where they were standing. They might have also thought that people were freaking out about the fake fire, thinking it was real. You couldn't see any flames or smoke from outside the building at this point. So they were still letting people on the ride, including the four amigos, the Waverly Boys. Their friend Jason had been on the train car behind them and seen them go into the ride. His train car was just nudging the black rubber doors to enter the ride as well when he was physically yanked from the train car by one of the staff members who finally understood the urgency of the situation. There were about 35 people on the ghost train that was now just starting to burn out of control. People were slowly finding their way out and joining the onlookers who just watched in awestruck horror as 
the doors that led out of the ride into the cage area would open to let empty train cars out, as well as the heat of the flames and the screams of people still stuck inside the ride. At this point, Jenny Godson was walking back to the ghost train, her ice cream in hand, and she saw the commotion and ran back to where she had left John and the boys. But they weren't there. Black smoke was now billowing from the building, which was engulfed in flames as tall as four metres high. And then there were the explosions. First, a couple of smaller ones that sent shooting flames out into the front cage. There were still screams heard inside the building when one final massive explosion shook the surrounding area and deafening the people watching in horror. Jenny Godson, with melting ice cream dripping down her hand and arm, it wasn't physically in her to believe what she was seeing or that her family could have possibly been on that ride. So she started searching for them frantically, expecting at any point to find John and the boys perfectly safe for them to run up and hug her, wondering where she had been. But as she first watched the firefighters struggle with the park's water pressure and eventually have to source water from the harbour itself, and then the ambulances arrive and police starting to search the wreckage after the final flames were extinguished around midnight, Jenny knew that she wasn't going to see John or the boys ever again. She just couldn't understand why they had gone on the ride without her, why they hadn't waited for her. She eventually became aware of someone standing by her side, 12-year-old Jason Holman, who would later be named by the press as the luckiest boy alive. He was also in a state of horror and disbelief, watching the police sift through the wreckage. Reality was slowly sinking in that his friends hadn't made it out of that blaze. Both Jenny and Jason were escorted out of the park with the rest of the crowd being given no information by police, as was the case with the Waverly Boys' parents who anxiously waited at the park gates, desperate for a glimpse of their boys. By 2.30am, police had found six bodies in the ghost train ruins and they found the seventh and final at 5.40am. The ghost train fire had claimed the lives of Jonathan Millings, Michael Johnson, Seamus Rahili and Richard Carroll, as well as John Godson and his two sons, Damien and Craig. John had been found with his arms reached protectively around his two boys, having obvious, this is so hard to get through, obviously been trying to shield them from the flames. And all of the victims died from either smoke inhalation or severe full body burns. On the 10th of June at 3 p.m., roughly nine hours after the final body had been found, there was a press conference and a written statement released in which Douglas Knight, the New South Wales detective inspector who had been put in charge of the investigation into the fire, told the Australian public that authorities had determined the exact spot where the fire had started, that it had been caused by an electrical fault, and that there was no evidence of foul play. No information was given to the families of the victims before this, by the way. They found out the exact same way as everyone else on the news. Funerals were held for the victims. For the Waverley boys, this happened at St Mary Magdalene Church where they had gone to Mass the night of the fire and the funeral for Jenny's husband John and their two boys Damien and Craig was held in their hometown of Warren. But in the years following the fire, the victims' families and people that witnessed the fire itself have said that something just doesn't sit right, that it feels like there's more to this story. Before we go any further, I would be amiss if I didn't mention this unsettling photo taken of Damien and a masked man in Circular Quay earlier on that day of the fire. If you've heard of the ghost train fire, you've probably seen this picture. It's been the source of a lot of urban legends, a lot of people saying that the man came out of nowhere and hasn't come forward since. 
or that he was a demon that fed on the souls of children. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I feel like it's just disrespectful to be talking about things like urban legends when we're talking about children that have died in such a horrific way. But what I will say is that there was a festival taking place in Circular Quay that day that the man was leading. So he didn't exactly come out of nowhere. Yes, it's a creepy photo and yes, it's a creepy mask, but this fire was not caused by a demon that feeds on the souls of children. I am Sorry if that's the story you came here for, but on with the real story. On the 11th of June, two days after the fire, Richard Carroll's mother, Mary, went to Luna Park to lay down a flower where her son had lost his life. She expected to find, you know, ruins of the ride, protected by crime scene tape, perhaps some forensic investigators sifting through the wreckage, trying to find indications of the fire's origin. But instead, she found nothing nothing but bare ground under her feet. There was not one shred of evidence that the ghost train had ever been there at all because by 6.30 a.m. the previous day, barely six hours after the final flames had been extinguished and less than one hour after the final body had been found, rather than taping off the scene and protecting it from contamination, police had had contractors brought in to actively clear the wreckage. There had been no forensic testing completed on the site at all. There had been no time to complete a proper forensic investigation. There had been no testing for accelerants and no searching for any indications of arson. This meant that what Detective Knight had claimed at the press conference about there being no evidence of foul play may have only been the case because police simply hadn't looked for any. Detective Knight had said at the press conference on the 10th that police had four independent witnesses that had come forward saying that they had seen the first flames and sparks appearing in an archway near the ceiling and the electrical system, but it was later found that not one of the 24 witness statements taken by police matched these details. Also, the southern fuse box where police claimed the fire had started was one of the only parts of the building left standing after the fire, as in it had clearly been affected by the fire, but was by no means of the imagination the source of the blaze. Apparently, they realised that their case was quickly unravelling because on the 14th of June, five days after the fire, police put out a public call for witnesses to come forward who could, quote, supply firm evidence to support their accident theory. This meant that the New South Wales police were not just neglecting to investigate the possibility of arson, but that they were actively excluding it because they already had plenty of witnesses. But these witnesses were telling a different story to the one that police wanted to sell. That night after the fire, a group of teenagers ran from Luna Park to Taldemundi Youth Refuge in North Sydney where they were staying, breathlessly telling the staff about the fire. Free tickets to the park had been donated to the refuge to distribute to the youths that were staying there at the time. And amongst the children that ended up going were 17-year-old Leslie Dow and 15-year-old Tina Shakeshaft. When they got back to the refuge, Leslie and Tina told their youth leader that they had overheard a conversation take place outside the ghost train just before people became aware of the fire inside. Leslie had been about two feet away from a group of teenage boys ranging in ages from 14 to 18 when he heard one of them say that they had spread kerosene inside the ride and lit it with a match. One of the others in the group called the first boy a fool and then the group ran away from the ride and out of the park. 
At about 2 a.m., Leslie and Tina were still relaying this story to the refuge staff when police pulled up outside and brought Leslie and Tina in to be interviewed about what they had seen and heard. Once at the station, Leslie was able to give a very clear description of all five of the teenagers he had seen gathered outside of the ghost train, including the apparent leader's shaggy blonde shoulder length hair and the rips in his sleeves. Also, that another was wearing jeans tucked into tall brown boots and that all of them had earrings in their left ears. He told police that he thought they looked like bikies. At the end of the interview, Leslie signed his statement and was taken back to the refuge, along with Tina, who had also given her own statement, backing up Leslie's. By 6 a.m. the morning after the fire, the detective senior constable who had interviewed Leslie and Tina had put out a wireless message to all the police cars in the Sydney area to be on the lookout for the group of teenagers that Leslie and Tina had described. But this message was later recalled and Leslie Downs was brought back to the station again to be interviewed this time by different police officers. And Leslie said in an interview that these police officers pressured and bullied him to change his story. They insinuated that if he didn't, something bad would happen to him, that someone would be after him. Leslie was only 17 years old. He was homeless. He didn't have anyone to tell him that what the police were doing, threatening him into changing his statement to match their version of events, was corrupt and illegal. So in his second statement, Leslie said that everything in his first statement had been a lie, that he had made up all of those fine details about that group of teenagers, and that he had never heard anyone say they had deliberately lit the fire. He was then promptly charged with giving a false statement and being a public nuisance. He was given a $100 fine and put on probation for 12 months. Tina Shakespeare was also interviewed again, but she refused to back down. She stood by everything she said in her first statement. The thing was, Leslie's story in his first statement was corroborated by multiple other witness accounts from that night. Firstly, at least two witnesses told police that the fire smelled of burning kerosene. And the operator of the ghost train that night, Albert Bessel, told police that about 10 minutes before people had become aware of the fire, a group of nine youths that he described as bikies had gone on the ride. He said that he had been concerned about what they were up to and had wanted to go into the ride to check that everything was okay, but due to the understaffing, he was stuck at the entrance punching tickets. His description of these youths matched Leslie's description of the teenagers he had seen, including the one with the blonde, shaggy, shoulder-length hair. And he told police that it was about 10 minutes after these people left the ride that he first heard the shouts of fire. Another witness said he had overheard teens from a rough crowd mention the words kerosene, and matches. Eleanor Gehazi and her husband Frank had been on the ghost train when the fire broke out and they later told police that they had seen bikies at Luna Park that night. Again, matching the description that was given by Leslie Dow. They also said that they had seen several of them exit the ghost train while they were queuing to get on. Eleanor and Frank later told their friends and families that they had been told by police that Police couldn't prove that bikies had lit the fire, so they should just forget about it and that their mentions of bikies would not be included in their witness statements. And they weren't alone. Today, a total of seven people have been found who reported to police seeing bikies at Luna Park that night. But because that wireless message that had been sent out after Leslie Dowd's first interview was recalled, the individuals these people saw have never been identified or questioned. In August 1979, about eight weeks after the fire, there was a coronial inquiry held into all seven deaths. The inquiry took three weeks to complete and 80 witnesses were called and during the inquiry it was found that the police theory about the fire being caused by an electrical fault was just highly highly 
Unlikely. The coroner, Kevin Sidney Anderson, instead suggested that the fire had been caused by someone carelessly or recklessly discarding a cigarette butt or a match and that this had ignited some litter inside the imitation fire. Despite the fact that smoking was not permitted on the ride and that none of the witnesses had reported seeing anyone smoking or smelling any cigarette smoke. The coroner found that while Luna Park management had failed to develop a adequate fire suppression program and as a result had failed in their duty of care to their patrons, that no criminal negligence had occurred that night, so no charges were going to be pressed. Ultimately, the outcome of the inquest was that the fire was a terrible accident. Never in the three weeks that the inquiry took place over was the possibility of arson even mentioned, let alone explored. And as you might have guessed, the witnesses that had mentioned the presence of bikies that night were not called forward to testify. Now, years after the fire, Richard Carroll's mother, Mary, received a strange phone call at about 9.30 at night from a woman she didn't know. And this woman was crying, begging Mary to forgive her. And Mary instantly thought of Richard's memorial all those years ago when she had seen a group of girls at the back of the church crying hysterically that she didn't know. And she instantly made the connection and realized that this woman must have been one of those girls. When Mary asked the woman who she was and why she was crying, the woman said that she had been in that group of girls that were meant to catch up with the Waverly boys at Luna Park that night, the ones that the boys had thought had just stood them up. But the woman told Mary that they had actually been stopped from going to Luna Park that night by her father, that her father had said that something was going to go down at Luna Park that night and he wasn't going to let them go for fear for their safety. That woman's father was Jack Rooklyn. Jack Rooklyn, a prominent figure in the organised crime world of Sydney, was a poker machine entrepreneur with ties to the American Mafia, and he was also a close associate of Abe Saffron. Abe Saffron was one of Australia's most famous crime figures, and he ran some of the most infamous nightclubs, bars, and strip clubs in King's Cross in Sydney. He was known as the King of the Cross, and also Mr. Sin, although he loathed this nickname that the press had crowned him with. Abe was worth roughly $25 million. Thanks to his dealings with, amongst other criminal activities, running brothels, insurance fraud, bribing police, blackmail, extortion, and arson. In fact, it was quite well known that one of Abe's preferred methods when it came to wrangling real estate was fire. In the early 80s, just after the ghost train fire, there were a string of other fires at popular establishments in King's Cross and Sydney Eastern suburbs. And at all seven of these locations, kerosene had been found. And of these seven locations, Abe had a vested financial interest in five of them. And the others, his close associates had an interest in. A coronial inquiry into the fires found that there was plenty enough evidence to place Abe in front of a court for conspiracy to commit arson and fraud but nothing ever came of this. In actuality, Abe Saffron, whose vast criminal career spread over 70 long years, only went to jail once for 17 months for tax fraud. And this was because of the sheer number of high-ranking police officers he had on his payroll, including, of course, our old pal, Douglas Knight, the detective inspector in charge of the investigation into the ghost train fire. In fact, just a couple of years before the ghost train fire, Detective Knight had been very sternly criticised during a royal commission for having a close, secret business relationship with Jack Brooklyn at the same time that he was supposed to be investigating Brooklyn and Abe Saffron for their involvement in organised crime. Also in Abe's pocket were Detective Knight's seniors, Assistant Commissioner Jim Black, 
and Deputy Commissioner Bill Allen. These men would later come to ruin thanks to their corruption linked directly to their involvement with Abe Saffron. Now, Luna Park itself was on a very, very valuable piece of land. It was a large site smack bang in the middle of Circular Quay opposite the CBD literally a land developer's wet dream. And Abe Saffron had coveted the land for, you know, just a casual 20 odd years. He had even put in a bid for the lease a couple of years before the ghost train fire, but it had been rejected. In November, 1979, the New South Wales government put out a call for new tenders for Luna Park. The park had been closed since the ghost train fire and they were keen to get it up and running again. Again, and they made a decision that has been called into question in the years following. In 1981, instead of giving the contract to any of the six eager tenders that had given them detailed presentations about their well thought out plans for the park, they gave the contract to a relatively unknown company called Harborside Amusements, run in part by Harold and Coleman Goldstein, two men who had exactly zero experience in fun fairs and amusement parks. Pretty odd choice, right? But allegedly there were some puppet masters pulling the strings behind the scene here. And these puppet masters were some very important political figures including a High Court judge, Lionel Murphy, and the New South Wales Premier, Neville Wran, literally the head of the state. And who were they pulling these strings for? Mr Sin himself. Abe Saffron, of course. Both of these men had been seen on multiple occasions at Abe Saffron's own house, you know, just having casual Saturday night drinks. They were all good pounds and they knew that Abe wanted the contract to Luna Park. But obviously, the lease of Luna Park couldn't just be handed over to Australia's most well-known crime lord. But you know who it could be handed over to? His cousins. Harold and Coleman Goldstein, who ran Harborside Amusements. Oh, and you know who could make sure that the profits from the park and from hundreds of Abe's own pinball and arcade machines that had been installed there would make their way discreetly into Abe's own personal trust? His nephew, Sam Croper, who managed Abe's trust and was made financial controller of Luna Park once Harborside Amusements came into control. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, Liz, stop, no, this is too obvious. Someone had to have noticed these connections. Then you're right. People did notice. They started putting the pieces together and asking questions. It was pretty apparent that Abe Saffron, who had known connections to bikies, had planned the fire as a way to finally win that lease to Luna Park. In fact, a former bikie has come forward and said he was at the barbecue where Abe put the command out to set the ghost train alight. But when New South Wales Corporate Affairs ran an investigation into the lease, they said they found zero evidence of a connection between Abe Saffron and Luna Park. The National Crime Authority, who at the time were like Australia's FBI or CIA, ran their own investigation in 1986 and they said that there was plenty of evidence that bikies had been on the ride minutes before the fire had broken out and that police had just intentionally let this trail run cold. They said that the initial investigation had just been fraught with gross inadequacies and that normal procedures and policies had just been thrown out the window from a very early stage. But they also said that they found no evidence that these inadequacies had been born of a corruption or any dishonesty in the police force. And they never even bothered investigating any interest that Abe Saffron might have had in Luna Park. It was really only the new South Wales Police Licensing Squad that had the balls to state facts as facts when they ran their own investigation also in 1986. Their report said that there seemed to have been a determined effort 
to hide the true family and business involvement of Abe Saffron in Harborside Amusements, and that taking this into account, the ghost train fire should be addressed from a different perspective. But just like so many other things in this case, this report went exactly nowhere. It was handed up to senior police and was just never followed up despite the damning information within it. It's like once people started looking into the fire and they wouldn't have had to look far to discover this web of corruption that surrounded it. But once they realised that if they pursued this, they would have to investigate Neville frickin' Ran, the New South Wales Premier, the literal head of the state, they backed down too terrified to even try and topple that Goliath. So if everything that has come to light over the last 40 years is to be believed, Abe Saffron orchestrated the ghost train fire, which claimed the lives of seven innocent people as a trigger to evict the current tenants of Luna Park and claim the lease for himself. And with the help of high-ranking police and literally the most powerful members of the New South Wales government, he got away with it. A prominent Sydney artist, Martin Sharp, who had a huge involvement with Luna Park and its restorations over the years, called it an act of terrorism, saying, and I quote, if you can get away with burning children in public on a Saturday night in an amusement park, you can get away with just about anything. In September 2006, Abe Saffron died at age 86 from complications from a leg infection. And a few months later, in March 2007, his niece, Anne Buckingham, spoke with the Sydney Morning Herald. And she said that even she believed that Abe was behind the ghost train fire. She said that her uncle liked to collect things and that one of those things was Luna Park. But she also said she didn't think that he had intended for anyone to die in that fire. She later denied that she had made any of these statements, despite the fact that she did definitely make them during a taped face-to-face -face interview. Last month in March 2021, the ABC released a three-part documentary series called Expose the Ghost Train Fire. It's definitely gripping viewing. They managed to just get so many interviews with eyewitnesses from that night and police and authority figures that were directly involved in the investigation. And the information they uncovered is just unbelievable. I've only managed to give you guys a very brief run through of the case compared to the incredible details they found during their investigation. And the good news is that the series is prompting demands from the public to reinvestigate the ghost train fire. There's literally headlines coming out every day at the moment, the latest of which say that the current New South Wales coroner, Teresa O'Sullivan, is right now considering if a new inquest is going to be held. There's also been a formal request for police to conduct a review of all of the evidence regarding the fire's cause and origin. I mean, like I said, the scene was cleared up just way too quickly for a lot of evidence to be gathered and tested, but a lot of people are optimistic that the families of the victims will finally get some closure and answers and justice. And that is it for this case, guys. Did I not tell you it was going to be a wild one? I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you so much for hanging out with me, Lily. Would you like to say bye? Do you want to say bye? <laughs> really? I feel like I did some work too. This is my chair. You look better on it though. This is what you guys are going to see in the next video. Lily's taking over. Lily and I both hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. We hope you have the best week of all time. And we will see you next time. Bye.